It was an awesome time uh, these last four weeks, right? We went through the three, three weeks of going through the prodigal son story with three different angles. I, I feel like I've only ever heard that preached from the angle of the youngest son. And so that was really cool. I just love how God's word is so multi-layered and it's like just so many different sides. It's got, usually it has one or two, maybe three ways to interpret it. But then as far as application, it's endless. God's word is so profound. So, so uh, yeah, I've gone astray. I can relate to the youngest son. I've, I've lived wild party life. And then I've, I've been self-righteous. I've had moments of self And I've had moments of mentoring, of loving people and teaching people. And it's just so awesome that I can relate to all three of those. So that was awesome. And then last week we had Shea come and she preached and that was awesome, right? <clears throat> I, I loved what she said about how God uses her for worship to be a missionary. And she, she had reiterated to us that God wants to use what's in your hand. That you guys all have special giftings, talents that God wants to use. And then she mentioned that... Uh, God takes us from surrender to surrender. And I thought that was just such a profound statement. That he really is. He, he's constantly asking us to go deeper with him. We're never just, I've made it. We've never arrived. We're always growing closer to God until one day we get to be seated with him in heaven. And that's going to be a glorious day. So, like I said, I can guarantee every one of us is feeling the pull to go deeper with God. And Jesus is worth it. He's worth giving up everything. He asks whether it's a job, it's a girlfriend, boyfriend, or a bad friendship, or our very lives. God is worth it. So we see this constantly through the book of Acts, right? The disciples have given much at the expense of Jesus. But if you ask somebody who's been following Jesus a long time, I doubt they would tell you that they've sacrificed much. That it really wasn't a sacrifice. Because Jesus gives them the good portion. He gives better than what they give up. Whatever we give to Jesus, what we get back from him is always greater. So last time we were in Acts, Paul and Silas were thrown into prison when Paul cast a spirit out of a slave girl who was doing divination. She was making these people a lot of money. And instead of wallowing in prison, instead of being upset at their circumstances, they decided, let's sing praises to God. Let's pray and give worship. They didn't see this as a bad situation. They saw it as a situation where they could better glorify God. And then the doors swung open, the, the prison shook. It was miraculous. And then instead of just taking the open door, which would have seemed obvious, leaving the prison, there was this guard about to take his life. And they saw the open opportunity that he could too accept Christ into his heart. And so this guy gets baptized. His whole family gets baptized. What an awesome thing, right? They, they gave up momentary freedom. They didn't know whether they would have been kept in prison after that. But instead they saw God was opening a door for this man to come to know Christ. That's how important that guard was to them. So you think they might have learned their lesson, right? They get out of prison. Uh, they might want to stop going to jail, stop preaching about Jesus, right? Everybody's getting kind of upset. But that's not what they do. So if, if you guys will, you guys can turn to Acts 17. That's where we're going to be at today. We're going to go through 1 through 15. Uh, but we'll see that, that uh, not preaching the gospel was not an option for Paul and Silas. It wasn't an option. How can we, knowing the truth, not give away freely the truth? Looking through this text, what stood out to me is, is how much they lean on the scriptures. How deeply they've studied it, how they handle it, how they use it to bring glory to God. So, when we learn how to handle the word, handle the Bible well, people will want to see for themselves. And that's what we want to see. We want to see people have their own faith, their own walk, into the scriptures, understanding scriptures, 
in community and on their own. So let's, uh, let's jump in. So Acts 17, 1 through 9 is what I'm going to read here. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. And it says, yeah, so, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul. And Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could find when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down, have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed and heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And so the title of this message today is going to be that Scripture turned the world upside down. For them to make a statement like that, stuff must have been happening. God was moving, and they were upset that these people had turned their world upside down. Nothing was the same after this message was preached to these people. So I love it. There was a, there was a synagogue in Thessalonica. And Paul, it says he had a custom on the Sabbath day to go and speak with everyone at the synagogue on the Sabbath so Paul was a man of the word. He knew the scriptures in and out. He spent time in it. He knew Jesus personally. And through, through the power of the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit's help, he could articulate, he could teach, he could preach. And so he would show up in the synagogue and persuade the Jews in the synagogue. He would persuade them of Jesus' true identity from the book they believed. But I mean, every week Paul was out there doing this, right? Because it took three weeks and then there was an uproar in Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Because Paul was consistent doing intentional outreach. People were coming to the faith. So imagine if each of us did some kind of intentional outreach every week. Even once a week. I believe that reading our Bible, praying, having quiet time, this is stuff we usually focus on, right? And it's important. We, we need it in order to grow with God. But I think just as much as we need to have personal quiet time with the Lord to grow and to experience God, we will experience him just as much, if not more, if we step out and we share our faith. If we preach the gospel. If we let people know that Jesus is real. Just as much as in our quiet time, we will experience God. Because now we're putting ourselves in a place where we need him to show up. So when you're by yourself, he shows He's showing himself to you, but there's a difference when you put yourself in a spot where he needs to show up for someone else. Because you can't convince them. You can't change their heart. You need God to do it. We need to be desperate for God, and we need to be desperate for people to be saved. So Demetrius and I, we have a goal of hitting the streets once a week. It's, it's been a little time since we've both been out. I, I try to go out when I can, but while we're wrapping some things up, but it's something we want to make a weekly practice. We hit the streets, prayed up. We know the word because we've been spending time in the word. We've been reading it. And when you step out like that, God shows up. We've had a few awesome encounters. One being charity right here. Right? We were walking down the street and, and I said a prayer as we were going. We had just started ministering. And then I said, hey, God, would you send us to somebody who needs to hear your word? Send us to the right person. And then I said, or send someone to us. And we turned like two corners. 
And then it's like one to two minutes between this, this prayer and this incident. And then I have my Bible in my hand. Me and Demetrius are walking past. And she yells out, hey, what are you reading? <laughs> or what you're reading, right? And uh, it was awesome. It was like we had this conversation and then David and Ethan started coming to Bible study. And then now Charity is here like every week and brings Stefan and Brett's here. And, uh, I'm so glad you guys are here. But, uh, but that's what God does when we step out and show up. And it wasn't just for us to grow, but it's for the people who we're out reaching out to. God shows up when we put ourselves in a spot where he needs to show up. There was another time, right? We just had some awesome things happen. Just going out, just putting ourselves, making ourselves available. Sometimes nothing happens. But sometimes really cool stuff happens. We, had, we had, uh, went to the skate park where a lot of kids kind of get high, drunk. And there was like four or five kids hanging out at the skate park. One of them had a beer in his hand. They were all probably a little high, drinking a little bit. And uh, we, started sh- we started preaching the gospel. Started asking them questions, and then we started preaching the gospel. And one of these kids was sitting on the back of this, the tailgate of this car, and his eyes, he was so focused on what was being said. Everyone else you could see was doing their own thing, still walking around, moving around. But this kid was just still. And he was just... And then his friend came up and tried to kind of mess with him. And he, he slapped his friend on the arm. And he said, listen to what they're saying. This is seriously what happened. This kid was so enthused that the Holy Spirit was touching his heart. It was It was incredible. And that's what happens when we step out, when we start to reach people who otherwise might not be reached. God shows up. They haven't heard anything like it. So Hebrews 4.12 says, well, before I get there, I guess. So we were preaching, right? We spoke from the word. When we went out to people, we, we speak from the word. We speak what we've heard and what we've seen from the word. And God's word is holy. It's pure, and it's righteous. And so when we share from his word, there's power in it, right? So Hebrews 4.12 says that, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from its sight, from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So we need the word. We need to be in the word because it shapes us and it molds us. As we read his word, how can you read it and not be convicted in your heart? All of us have flawed areas. And when we read God's word, his perfect word, it challenges our imperfectness. So it doesn't just transform us though. It's also for transforming the lives of people around us. So we need to study it. We need to learn it. And even to a degree, we need to be able to teach it. Paul understood the power of the word. He understood that no falsities can stand in the truth. When we are giving something that is 100% truth, there's no hiding from it. It demands a response. It sticks with people. Once, once you've shared the gospel with somebody, once you've talked to somebody about Jesus, it sticks with them. It's like uh, they might not have just completely accepted the Lord. They might have not just given their life up, surrendered, fallen to their knees and prayed a prayer. They might, but they might not have. And what you might have done is you placed a rock in their shoe. So they're going to be walking around. It's now going to be in their thoughts. And they're going to keep stepping on this rock. Isn't that annoying? When you step on a rock, when you've got a rock in your shoe, you want, what's the urge? Take the shoe off and get the rock out of your shoe. And that's what we want people to do, to hear the truth and to let the truth have its way in their hearts. Because it's the word of God that cuts through people's hearts. So like I said, right, the word demands a response, but sometimes it pulls out a stronger response than we would have liked, than we would have wanted or expected. So let's reread verses 5 through 9, and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. It says, but the Jews were jealous 
and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged, down, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So look at what happens here, right? This is one of the other responses to the word. Jesus warns us over and over that following him has a cost. It is costly to follow Jesus. Paul knew it. He'd counted the cost a long time ago. Otherwise, he wouldn't still be preaching after being thrown in prison. He was stoned in Lystra. He was ran out of Iconium. He was beat. He, was, he preached in other places. He was going around preaching, even after these things were happening to him. He... He was giving away this information that he had learned in his quiet time. We have to be ready for backlash just like Paul was. He was prepared. He counted the cost. So our personal devotion has to be in tune with our outward ministry. And our personal devotion should turn into outward ministry. So I've had people angry at me for talking about Jesus, right? When I was, when I was first uh, saved... I went around, we were at the theater church, and I had these uh, door hangers. And I went around to, I don't know how many doors, a few hundred doors, just knocking on doors. And uh, if somebody answered the door, if nobody answered, I'd leave it on their door. And if they answered, I'd offer prayer, talk with them. And uh, there was one guy, I remember, I, I went up to his house, his garage was open, he was sitting in his garage. And I came up, it was across the street from the theater, and I said, hey, I'm a, we have a church just across the street from here, Generations Church. Just, just wanted to know if you, you know, this is an invite. You want to come? And also, uh, he just said no. And I said, well, can I pray for you? And his response was, no, you can't. It was something like this. No, you can't pray for me. God is dead. That's what he told me. And he was pretty angry that I had, that I had the audacity to bring up Jesus to him or God. And... Uh, and then I tried to reason with him a little. I had a little bit of pushback, and he just kept repeating it. God is dead. God is dead. God's been dead a long time. Right? And see, this, this is really a light scenario. Honestly, this is light. You could walk away from that and not have too hard of feelings. But I fully expect that if we truly live radical lives, and we start digging into the scriptures, well, what we call radical, but really what Jesus tells us to do, so, if we start to reason with people about the gospel, if we start to preach and share the word, we're going to start facing real adversity. If we choose to take God at his word, to trust that he's going to fulfill his word, we do our part, he will do all his part, which is way more than what we can do. Then there's going to be people, the, the church is on the rise, right? This is, the, the, um, this is what we're going through. The church is on the rise. That's what we're talking about. But when the church is on the rise, so will skeptics be on the rise. So will angry people. Satan would love to stop the movement of the church. And it's, it's easy to do, frankly. It's easy for us to stop the momentum that we get when we hear the word. When the word gets into our hearts and when, we're, when uh, it's shaping us and convicting us, it's easy to, to brush it off. It's easy to be a little more calm. A little more passive. Because that's what everyone wants you to be. So here the local Christians were persecuted, right? They were dragged out of their homes. And they were forced to give money to the authorities in order that they could go free. The Jews in Thessalonica didn't want their world flipped. They didn't want things to change. And I think this is why people give this reaction. They don't want things to change. They don't want to change. And they don't want to see people they know change either. So you get adverse reactions. The scriptures are being spoken, but not how these people have studied it before. 
They didn't want the change. They wanted to keep their world intact, these things that they'd built, these traditions, these ideas. They wanted them to remain intact. They wanted to stay comfortable. And so Paul and Silas were on the move again. Here they were, kicked out of town, on the move again. So we'll jump into 10 through 15 here. And it says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. Essentially saying everybody was believing it, right? People were just falling in line. But, uh, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, also they came here too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So this is every Christian's dream, right? Any minister would love to have this crowd listening to their sermon. Anyone who's ever walked the earth as a Christian, if you gave a message and everybody was searching the Bible themselves, or they asked for a Bible and was like, let me see, and then they just took it, any minister would love to have this. This would be the perfect audience. So wouldn't it be nice, right, if every, if every time you talked to someone about Jesus, they were like, well, let me, let me see. Let me see. Every single time. So they... They wanted to know themselves, right? So these people basically wanted to make it their own and they wanted to turn around and tell other people, right? Because they were, they were really taking it. This is what discipleship looks like. But the Bereans had to make the faith their own. They were hungry. They needed to know more for themselves that the things that they were being told were true. They wanted to clarify with the Holy Scriptures. They went to the Scriptures out of curiosity for the truth. So us, we hold the Bible as true as the inerrant word of God, right? So we ought to know what's in it. And we should spend ample time getting to know it. The Bereans were in it daily, it says. Every time Paul preached to them, they were in it. They were hungry for the truth. They were seeking everything that he said, they were probably looking up. Is that true? So, and we do know that everyone's not going to respond like this. That's the nature of the gospel, right? Right? But sometimes you're going to run into people or crowds that respond this way. They're hungry. They've been desiring the word. So we can, we can see, again, there's going to be different reactions to the scripture. Some people will accept it. Some people will be saved. Some will need to verify it for themselves. Some will not want to hear it. And some may respond harshly. And some may even respond and, and act in persecution. There may be physical violence to your gospel message. In America, it's a lot less common, but it is a possible reality. So Paul had to deal with intense rejection. Like I said earlier, he'd been beaten, stoned, imprisoned, but that didn't stop him from continuing to preach the gospel. He was reasoning with people in other towns. He'd been stoned and beat for the gospel, yet he keeps on speaking. So just to put in perspective, guys, so I was looking at the, on the internet today, right? There's about, it says 113,000 100 is the rough number of people in Gresham, right? So let's say you go and you tell five people about Jesus. They don't want to hear it. Well, guess what? There's good news because there's about 113,000 other people who might want to hear the gospel message. So this is a telltale for us that if it doesn't go well when you try to talk about Jesus, if you get turned down, that doesn't mean stop doing it. You keep fishing because Jesus calls us fishers of men. If you're a fisherman and you go out to fish and in the first hour you, you get a bite, right? Your line breaks or you, or you lose your bait. Are you just going to pack up and go home? 
That'd be a waste, right? Usually you have to drive pretty far to go fishing unless you're right next to a fishing pond. But who, what fisherman is going to go home after losing one fish? I don't think anyone is. And so, so you'll put some new bait on. You might get a new hook, but we don't simply go, get up and go home. So I want to challenge you guys this week. I want you guys to just take a second, kind of bow your heads. And I want you just to think of three people you know that are not walking with Jesus. And if you're having a hard time thinking of someone, maybe think of someone in your family, some people in your family, or in your workplace. Now I want you to remember these names. Maybe write them down if you want. But uh, pray for these people. Reach out to them this week. Maybe you could share the gospel with them. And if you're not yet comfortable with doing that, if you're not yet comfortable with sharing the gospel, I would encourage you, if you want to learn how to share the gospel, please talk to someone on the staff here. We would love to better help you be equipped to share the gospel. And if you're not quite there, you could, you could invite them. So you guys got the names. Because guys, if this good news is true, if the Bible is true, then the message in it takes precedence over everything else. Jesus becomes the most important thing in the world. As, as Shea was saying last week, whatever Jesus asks of you, isn't he worth it? Isn't Jesus worth whatever he asks of you? The Bereans had to make a decision, right, after searching the scriptures. If what this is true, it's going to change everything for us, for the Bereans. They can't live like they used to live. There's no room for it. They can't believe like they used to believe. They knew the Bible to be true, and now they were seeing a new understanding of what the Scripture was telling them. They were seeing that prophecies from hundreds, even thousands of years, were being fulfilled in real time. And prophecies are still being fulfilled today. So worship team, you can go ahead and come back up. Um, but second, in, P, in Second Peter 1, 19-21, Peter writes, <clears throat> And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a light lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So be in the Bible, guys. Get to know it. Because like Peter's saying, the world is dark. But we have full access to the light. He says the Bible is like a lamp in a dark place. We need the Word of God. And we have so many Bibles here. So, we believe in the inerrant word of God and we believe that this book wasn't written by mere man. We've been gifted this love letter from Yahweh, from God, from the great I am Jesus, right? The most important message we see throughout the Bible is this. We read in scripture that God made his commands. And us knowing that God is good, if his commands are good, well, if he's good, his commands are good too. And the scripture tells us that all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God, meaning that none of us measure up. God gave us standards and none of us made the, none of us made the quota, right? <clears throat> none of us is good and we've all done wrong by God and by the people around us. Then Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages for sin is death. So every one of us, because we have sinned and done wrong by either God or by our neighbor, which is anyone, right? God can't let it slide. Because he's true. There has to be a punishment for evil. 
If God is righteous and just, evil has to be punished. But the good news is he loves us so dearly that he didn't want us to be punished. And so he sent his son down in the flesh to live a sinless life, to die the death of a criminal, to be beat, mocked, spit on, nailed to a cross in our place. The death that we deserved because we were all criminals. According to God's law, we're all criminals. And he took our place. And all you have to do is believe that, that Jesus took your place and that he, di- he rose from the grave three days later. And then you'll be free, forgiven, born again to a new life with Jesus. And so we're going we're gonna to get into some communion. So if you guys don't have a communion cup, please raise your hand. And someone will go pass that around. Yes. So guys, what I've just said, this gospel message, what Jesus has done, this is why we take communion. We remember what Jesus has done. And this is why we share this same message so often because it's central central to all of us that we've been saved and set free and given a new life. And so the word challenges us into that new life. We want to be people of the word. We want to live by the word. We want it to feed us and be our daily bread. And so in Matthew 26, 26 through 28, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it. All of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So I'm going to pray over the elements before we take communion. So Jesus, I just thank you that your, your blood was shed. Your body was broken when you didn't have to. You didn't have to go through it for us, but you chose to, Lord. You love us, and I'm so thankful that you love me, Lord, and that you love each and every one of us here. So thank you for your body that was broken. Thank you for your blood that was spilt. We give you honor and we give you glory. Teach us to live the way you want us to live, following you wholeheartedly, Lord. As we eat this, this is, this is significant, Lord. Let us do it with a right heart. Let us make amends with people who we need to make amends with. Let us, let us be pure and holy before you, God. So if you guys would, go ahead, eat the bread, take the juice. Thank you, Jesus. So if you've been moved today, if you feel God is moving on your heart, that you want to grow deeper with the Lord, that this is God's calling you to a new place of surrender, you want to know more of the word, you want to get steeped in the word, I'm going to have some people up here that will pray for you. And I'm going to ask you to, to come up. Come up and ask for prayer. That this is a time to, to not just with God alone, but to tell, tell your brothers and sisters that you want to grow with the Lord. So I'm going to challenge you guys to come up during our last song.